Welcome to the lecture. Astronomers have discovered thousands of extrasolar planets or exoplanets. Is any of them inhabited like the Earth? How can we search for it? In this lecture, I will talk about the techniques to study exoplanet atmospheres and possibly surfaces, which is an essential step toward finding life on exoplanets. Detection of exoplanets typically come with two properties, the size and the orbit, including the distance from the host star. For evaluating their potential for life, we definitely need to get more information. But how? It has to be reminded that exoplanets are light years away. This means that it's not realistic to actually visit there. And it's not possible either to get the spatially resolved images, unlike the case of solar system planets. They are just point sources, and we have to rely on remote observations of these faint dots. But observations of these faint dots, if possible at all, can in principle give us the hints about the nature of the planets. For example, if you observe an Earth twin, this is the overall spectrum you would get. At shorter wavelength, the planet illuminates by scattering the light from the host star, and its broad features depends on, for example, surface composition, atmospheric pressures, and clouds. On the other hand, in the invisible infrared range, the planet emits light because of its thermal energy, and its baseline depends on the temperature structure of the surface layers. Imprinted in these baselines are the narrower features due to absorption by atmospheric species. In the case of an Earth twin, they include astrobiologically important water vapor, oxygen, and ozone features. We could also potentially use the time variation of these features due to planet rotation, which essentially allows us to scan the planet and highlight the regional features. However, it's not straightforward to detect the light from exoplanets. Seen from afar, an exoplanet is very close to its own host star, and the star is several to ten orders of magnitude brighter. It's equivalent to see a firefly right next to the lighthouse. Suppose you try to take a picture of an exoplanet. Then the host star is always there, and on the imaging plane, the star is blurred, and the planet is in the skirt of it. Compared to the peak intensity, the skirt is orders of magnitude darker, but planets are often even fainter, so the signal is varied. In order to identify the planetary signal, we need to suppress the light from the host star using special instruments. The idea of such direct imaging observations of Earth-like planets date back to the 1990s, but the starlight suppression is technically challenging. In the past decade, direct imaging has been successful for young luminous giant gaseous planets at wide orbit. Earth-like planets are about 10 times smaller in diameter and much fainter than these successful targets. The efforts are ongoing to achieve the high suppression level to be able to detect an Earth wind. Meanwhile, the discovery of transiting planets opened up the new possibilities to study exoplanet atmospheres without using the special instruments. A transiting planet is a planet which passes right in front of the star because its orbital plane is close to the line of sight. During the transit, a small portion of the stellar light is filtered through the planetary atmosphere. By analyzing the spectrum of this tiny portion and finding the scattering or absorption features in there, we can learn about the atmospheric composition and the presence of condensate such as clouds. 
This technique is called transmission spectroscopy. In many cases, transiting planets also pass behind the host star, and it's called planetary or secondary eclipse. At the time of the eclipse, the planetary flux is blocked by the star. So the difference between the out of eclipse total flux and the inner eclipse flux corresponds to the brightness of the planetary day side. This way, using planetary eclipse, we can identify the spectrum of the planet without directly separating the star and the planet in the imaging plane. In addition, while the planet orbits the star, the varying portion of the planetary day side faces us, and the planetary flux changes in time accordingly. In turn, although we cannot resolve the star and the planet, the time variation in the total flux can be attributed to the planetary component, assuming that the star is stable. These three techniques have been successful with hot Jupiter-like planets and have re revealed some of the atmospheric species and thermal structures. In order to apply them to smaller, potentially habitable planets, however, we need to push the current technology to its limit. The techniques introduced so far have pros and cons, and the relevant targets vary. So we will use all of them to study various aspects of exoplanets. In the next decade, new powerful observatories with spectroscopic capability will come into play. The main targets will probably be large gaseous planets, but some basic investigations of tertiary-sized planets are also being attempted. Future missions aimed at the most detailed study of potentially habitable planets are currently under discussion. In this lecture, we discuss the key observations to study the nature of exoplanets beyond their size and their orbit. I encourage you to think further about how you would find life on, a, on an Earth wind light years away using these techniques. It will provide a unique view on Earth's biosphere. Here are the suggestions for further reading. And this is the information of the studies referred to in this lecture. Thank you for listening.